death striations sometimes are very difficult to be seen. And I will present here a few cases, a couple of cases, in which acknowledgement of the existence of striations is difficult. And this happens when you have complex microstructures in which you have alternating brittle and ductile phases. One of these cases we'll see better after is an aluminum silicon magnesium cast alloy tested at room temperature instead of the 150 or 250 degrees C that we were having before. Now, let's go and examine the microstructure. You see that in this case, these are cast alloys in which you have dendrites of the aluminum matrix and around dendrites you have eutectic zones in which you have the co-precipitation of brittle particles and ductile aluminum phase. As I was telling you, at high temperature you see the striation. At uh, room temperature, striation aren't seen. To understand, we have uh, to make uh, a link between the crack growth velocity and the de applied delta K. And this, as you see, is what is known as being the Paris law. This is an exponent that is a Paris parameter, and this is a pre-exponential term that is also a Paris parameter. How much should n be? Now, the crack advance is uh, proportional to the crack Tip opening displacement, and we know that uh, this is proportional to delta K, K max minus K min to the square. If uh, we have a ductile material in which this uh, striation formation model holds, n should be equal to this exponent. But, as I was telling you, there can be contribution to the crack advance of other uh, fracture propagation modes, which can be cleavage or intergranular ruptures. The lower is the value of K1C, the, value, the lower is the fracture toughness of the steel. The higher is the value of this exponent, and we can have uh, n values that goes to four. And if, for instance, you have uh, a cast iron, a lamellar graphite cast iron, n can be to equal to nine, 10, or 11, because one of the jumps comprises 
an entire graphite lamella. <coughs> We'll see, before going back to the aluminum silicon magnesium hypothetic alloy, we'll go first to see heterolytic steel. And both alloys were tested at room temperature. This is the Paris law for heterolytic steel. Notwithstanding the the fact that it is a, a steel with 0.4% carbon, the high amount of chromium, 2%, 1.5% of manganese, 1% of nickel, and 0.5% of molybdenum, yield a almost completely perlitic structure. And uh, this is the Paris law as determined on this material, and the exponent is 3.3. And if we take a rail steel, which is a 0.70% carbon, so it is almost completely perlitic, and uh, with little amount of ferrite, you have the same type of uh, Paris law. So it's not the chemistry, but it's the microstructure that uh, controls the Paris law. In general, we have an exponent of 3.3, uh, 3.4, and uh, the Paris law is valid if delta K is comprised between, well, ten, 20, even 10 and 70 megapascal squared root of meter with delta KTH in the vicinity of 10, slightly less than 10 megapascal squared root of meter. And uh, if we can make experiments with uh, ratio between k max and k min in the vicinity of 0.1 this range 20 to 70 leads to k max values comprised between 22 and 78 megapascal squared root of meter now we have to think of the plastic zone in front of the crack tip that is growing by fatigue, so by alternating stress. And uh, the maximum size of the plastic zones is obviously, obviously controlled by K max. And uh, the size of the quasi static plastic zones uh, vary between. 2.5 10 to the minus 5 meter and 3.5 10 to the minus 3 meter if we adopt the usual formulation for satellite structures in plane strain or and we'll see later why do I say so complete ferrite structures in plane stress we should uh, think of the fact that even if we are considering cyclic plastic zone sizes that are smaller than the ones that I was calculating before in a quasi-static mode are much larger than a single ferrite lamella thickness which is in the range between 10 to the minus 6 10 to the minus 7 meter. So we are comparing these sizes of the order of 10 to the minus 5 meters, 10 to the minus 3 meter, with these lamella thickness of a ferrite, which is in the range between 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7, 
meter range and you know that uh, the distance between the ferrite lamella depends on the way the temperature at which perlite was formed is much you have a much finer perlite if the temperature is less than the eutectoid temperature of the steel what is the meaning of this consideration you have a plastic zone that is much larger than a single lamella thickness. So a plastic zone that comprises many ferrite and cementite lamella. Like you see over here, this is the crack that is advancing. Then you are increasing the K. You are hitting K max. The size of the plastic zone grows to a maximum and you see that the distance that is covered by the plastic zone is many ferrite and cementite lamella. You can count about 15 the white ones are the cementite, the dark ones are the ferrite lamella. What's the difference of mechanical behavior between ferrite and cementite? Ferrite is ductile. Cementite is brittle, is a carbide. And if we have a plastic zone size, we have that the stress goes into plastic and the deformation goes into plastic. And the poor cementite lamella cannot withstand that strain. And so what do they say? My God, that's too much for me. And they break. And then the ferrite lamella, they remain standing the load alone. It's like the teeth of a comb that withstand the, pre the, the stress one by one and the crack is advancing. <coughs> <coughs> so let us give a look to this simple model. This is the crack that is advancing and is progressing into a ferrite lamella. And in front of it, there are cementite lamella that are already broken by the fact that they cannot withstand the strain that is associated with the plastic zone. And after this stage, this is a ferrite lamella that is broken, this is a cementite that is already broken, and then it goes into the next one ferrite lamella that withstands the situation. What is the stage between this and this? It's a stage in which if the delta K is small enough, so we are in the low part of the Paris law, you have the possibility of formation of a striation. But where do you have it? On top of the broken ferrite lamella. The ferrite lamella that is exposed to this uh, alternating stress field is alone in withstanding the crack growth 
and we if the delta k is low enough there can be some cycle that are spent in overtaking lame the lamella one two maximum three cycles and so we should see something on top of the broken lamella to see it we have to use very powerful modern scanning electron microscope and <coughs> so looking again we have to see this situation but uh, to see striations on top of the ferrite lamella we have to have delta k not too large otherwise otherwise if the delta k is over 40 megapascal squared root of a meter a single jump goes ahead you don't see anything so you have to look at it at the very early stage of crack growth otherwise you will not see it okay this is a fatigue fracture of a perlite colony perlite colony is comprised by ferrite and cementite lamella and what you see here is uh, just the set of ferrite lamella that have been overcome by the fatigue process. So these are not striation. You see striation only on top of the various ferrite lamella. You see some over here, you see some over here, and uh, to say that has been a fatigue fracture that takes you some time to understand. And careful observation. The first time I looked at this photograph, it didn't tell anything to me. I had to develop all the reasoning that I was telling you before to be sure that I was seeing a fatigue failure of a perlite colony. And then we went to prove this considering a rail steel. Rails are made by steels I see sorry steels of this composition around 0.70 carbon 1.0% manganese and this is the rail the head of the rail this is the web of the rail this is where we made our metallographic observation and here where we took our fracture mechanic samples and we were testing it so there was a previous fatigue crack growth stage and a last fracture stage under which we were measuring the fracture toughness this is the sample, it's a three point, four point bending sample. And this is the microstructure of the steel. As you can see, you have very limited zones of uh, ferrite and the various perlite colonies have different orientation. 
in some cases you were seeing the colony not per perpendicular to the metallographic section. In other cases, you were seeing perpendicular to the metallographic section. And so this is where we made our metallographic observations and later we did our fractographic observations. If you increase the magnification, go to 5,000, you see these. And if you go to 25,000, you see these. This is a metallographic section. So what you are seeing as prominent on the surface are the unetched cementite carbide. Carbides are more resistant to hatching than ferrite. Okay? The opposite is the other case when we have elongation and you have elongation on the fracture only on the ferrite and not on the cementite. Let's go again. Just a moment. This is a metallographic section. How is it uh, obtained? It is obtained by polishing and then by etching. And uh, the etchant consumes the ferrite and does not consume the cementite. This is the fatigue fracture surface of these same rail steels. We were going to a day A in the end, low enough to be able to see the top of the ferrite lamelle as affected by fatigue. You are not seeing striations. You are seeing the fracture of perlite colonies. And each line is the top of a ferrite lamella that is elongated by the plastic deformation. Only ferrite lamella can withstand elongation and then they fracture in the end. We go to 5,000, then we go to almost 25,000, and we see striations only on the top of each ferrite lamella. So in another case, we are going to a much lower DA in the end, about one half than before. This is the direction of crack growth. We have to take a perlite colony that is uh, almost perpendicular to the crack growth. You see the ferrite lamella that are that broke after some straining. And you see the top of the ferrite lamella that has got, in this case, a couple of striations. It is not easy, but it can be seen and can be assessed as a fatigue fracture in the case of perlitic steel. Another case, about 20 nanometer per cycle, two different situation, one here in red, one here in blue. The red one, you see the striation on top of each lamella. Let us go to the wine, to the one circled in blue. Again, some striation on top 
of the right lamella. Since we are here at this stage, we can see how is the fracture, the final fracture. The final fracture is a brittle fracture. This is a room temperature. Remember, the, the C85 steel, the 0.85 car percent carbon steel that we were seeing in the beginning that had very low variation of absorbed energy and this is the fatigue this is the final overload fracture and if we go and see over here we see that ferrite and cementite lamelle in a single colony fracture on the same plane, these are different um, ferrite and cementite lamella that uh, collapse almost on the same cleavage plane. And so you have a very tiny separation between the two different types of lamelle, but <coughs> that is overload fracture. This is another case of overload fracture. We are seeing fracture not um, through a perlite colony, but through separation of a single crystal. This is a fer ferrite crystal, and you have that kind of uh, river pattern that we were speaking of in the beginning. Allora, what we can conclude on a rail steel, the fractographic detection of a fatigue fracture in a metallic alloy with a complex microstructure is, first of all, a demanding task. Second, the hypothesized fatigue micromechanisms should be assessed by considering both the cyclic plastic zone size and the Paris law. And we have been reporting examples regarding the ectoid microstructure found in a perlitic steel. And fatigue fracture surfaces have been analyzed. And I do repeat, you have to go to a very high magnification. 25,000, 20,000, 25,000, and that uh, has to be done in a clean scanning electron microscope. And now let's go back uh, to this uh, type of alloy in which uh, we were uh, called to solve a real problem. This is a motorcycle fork, which broke, is a front fork leg, broke into the leg, and we assessed in the end that it was room temperature, fatigue, crack, propagation. What was really puzzling in this case, that if we were going to look at it macroscopically, this is a micro, micrograph, a microfractograph, it appeared as being a fatigue fracture. And you could see the rim of the passage between one type of fracture to the last piece of fracture, which was by definitely by overload. But we could not see it unless we were doing careful observations at the microscopic level of observation.
what do you see? Macroscopic. You see that there is a fan of lines that points to a point like this, another fan of lines that points to a point like this, then a stabilization of the fracture front, and then the final overload that we can say only after an extensive work on the scanning electron microscope. But what was puzzling is I can see something looking at it with my naked eye. This is just a replica. It's two, three times what you see on your with your naked eye. And the why can I, cannot I see microscopically? Well, these are, the, this is the chemistry of the fork leg. You see a silicon manganese, an aluminum silicon manganese uh, uh, alloy. We measured the hardness, it, which was within the standard minimum requirements for die cast, and that is uh, how the alloy is uh, characterized in terms of the strands, the, in terms of the standards. We have uh, a K1C from the literature of 27 megapascal squared root of meters and a limit, uh, a fatigue limit of 95 megapascals measured, you know, that the aluminum ones we have uh, to give a definite uh, value of the cycles, 5 to the 10, 5 times 10 to the 7 cycles. Go, let's go back to the metallographic microstructure. We have an aluminum silicon modified eutectic network with the aluminum ligament thickness of about 5 microns and we can recognize various types of the other non-metallic faces, dark magnesium to silicon, elongated needles of uh, silicon aluminum iron faces, and other can that uh, are not shown here can be of this type of chemistry. And uh, in the original dendrites, we have the aluminum matrix with some beta prime strengthening precipitates that are precursors of MG2 silicon. And that, as I was telling you, they are inside the alpha dendrites. But the fracture doesn't go across the dendrites, it follows this path, and it is this path that has to be assessed as being not an overload fracture path, but a fatigue fracture path. <laughs> At least in the first part of the overall fracture. Uh, I am a metallurgical engineer, I have to speak also of face diagrams, and we, this is the working zone of the face diagram in which we are. Now, fractography. We were able to recognize many casting defects that were coalescing into one and so we have to consider that to coalesce various defects into one, we have 
either to consider the situation of coalescence, which is the type of fracture over here, but most of all, we have to try to ascertain if there is a variation of fracture mode from this point to that point. So what we did? In the beginning, we didn't know anything. So what we were doing, we were exploring all these paths and then directions oblique to the fork leg point where the fracture had to initiate. So we were beginning from this defect and we were analyzing the whole situation, you see that here there is a skin oxidized, an oxide skin that itself is a casting defect. So that was probably one of the initiation points, but since there were many of these oxide skins along the front, we could hypothesize many initiating points. And between defects, we add fracture of the interdentritic uh, regions and first of all, you have to see cleavage of silicon particle. Again, let's go back to the previous model. We have stresses and silicon particles are the ones that cannot withstand plastic deformation, okay? So they cleave along their cleavage plane and they break. And then you have the resisting ligaments. Some of them are sharp. Some of them, they are with some sort of grooves on top. They can be hints of some sort of fatigue fracture, but you cannot be sure. As I was telling you, far from the initiating defects, at about eight millimeters from the fork leg basis, Noi were able to see a distinct fracture morphology variation that takes place over a short distance. Let's go back for a moment. Where is this eight millimeter? If this is four millimeter, it's about here. And we had to carefully analyze the variation of a fractured path in both the situations. If it is fatigue, you should see before the formation of grooves on top of the aluminum resisting ligaments. And you see, here they are. And after, these are silicon particles, these are the aluminum ligaments that are the ones that have on top striation, possible striation. And after you see the ligaments that are broken to a razor blade top, this is not a groove, this is just a fracture 
probably a um, shear instability fracture because there was some precipitation precipitate inside. So we had to go and see in another case, we had another type of morphology of um, precipitates of brittle particles, but uh, all over razor blade fractures, which are typically of overload of ligaments that have been straining to a point. We had two, let's go back to what we have seen in the first hour. Ductile overload, continuum, plastic deformation to a point. And there is what you see over there, a razor blade because you have plastic deformation to a point. So let's go again to make a model like before we had done for per light fracture. We have a cyclic, a cyclic plastic zone in front of the crack tip sketched over the microstructure. So we have a region of high deformation. And if you uh, go and consider zones like these, you have brittle particles of silicon, of other types of precipitates that break before. And they do confine the fatigue path to these regions. The ligaments are 5 times 10 to the minus 6, six meter thick. The silicon particles are broken by cleavage, leaving a set of resisting metallic ligaments. Again, is the metal that withstands the strain in front of the advancing teeth. You see, this is another situation in which you have fatigue, fracture, and here you have all the breakage of the silicon particle. But inside there is the resisting aluminum matrix ligaments that break before because the plastic zone is much larger than both the silicon particles and the metallic ligaments. So when the cyclic plastic zones arrives close to a eutectic aggregate, the silicon particles are broken first, leaving a network of, again, as I was telling before, of resisting matrix ligaments in front of the crack tip. Now we see the plastic zones over the pre one of the fractured zones. You have the silicon particles that breaks and the resisting ligaments that resist. And so again, we do the same type of reasoning as before the crack tips arrives into an aluminum alloy ligament. In front of it, there are broken silicon particles. And you have that between the, the stage one and the stage two, you may have the formation of striations on top 
of the resisting ligaments. Like we were saying before in the case of perlite, which is repeated from the previous situation that we were analyzing on perlite. Now we may have large silicon plates, and again, the silicon plates break in front of the crack tip due to the plastic zone that strains them too much. So let's go to the Paris law and um, the, the A in the N is in the vicinity of 5 to 10 mi to minus 6. If uh, K max is greater than 15 megapascal squared me meters, each ligament is broken in one cycle. And you cannot see creation because the delta K is too much. If the delta K is over here, it is too much. It overcomes the ligament. If the delta K, <coughs> if K max is less than 15 megapascal squared root of a meter, then it may be possible to detect striations on fracture fractured ligaments because we are in the lower part of the hypothesized Paris law. To detect the striation if K max is 5 to 6 megapascal square root of meter, then the I in the end is 10 to the minus 8, and this may allow to detect the striation by using the magnification of 5,000, 10,000. <sighs> Weak striation on the broken ligaments between the silicon particles can be detected in the previous picture as best seen. Next, here are the top, the grooves on top. You see over here, you see over here, you see over here, you see over here. These are signs of fatigue. And see the broken silicon particle, how tight is uh, tied to the existing aluminum ligaments. And now one c may ask. Why do I see this at room temperature and not at higher temperature? Let me see. OK, why do I see this at uh, 250 degrees C and I do not have the same behavior at room temperature? Well. The reason is that over here the silicon particles are broken in several pieces and they are not firmly tied to the ligament of aluminum matrix. So the ligaments are acting completely free since the beginning of the fatigue process. And then the fatigue process cuts the ligament, giving a striation, multiple striation. You, you see, this is one of the ligaments. You see how many striations go from this broken particle to this broken particle, because then you have plain stress, and you have 45 degrees climbing of the, of the fatigue fracture and so multiple striation. But at room temperature, as we were seeing before, I was showing you how tied are the silicon particles to the ligaments. And this doesn't allow the ligament to be crossed completely free. 
and uh, well before I leave I would like to have some questions but before I want to tell you that you cannot act as a fractographer alone you have to make or have somebody make for you and really the in-depth stress analysis because before saying that in a fork leg you may have some fatigue fracture you have to, to demonstrate that in a fork leg you can have alternating stresses if you don't demonstrate that people will laugh at you okay I stop here because uh, Professor Spagnoli told me that you have to give uh, proof of the fact that you have been uh, sitting here for uh, four half a day. Um, in the resume of the lecture, I was also telling you that sometimes you have to clean the fracture surfaces before you can perform analysis. Mi fa vedere quel piccolissimo e mi sembrava ovvio la maggior parte my mind did tell now I've been speaking you have been speaking too much English let's go simple no sorry usual usually to clean a steel surface from oxide you use an ammonium citrate 10% silico riesciamo ad, um, ad allargare 10% silicon for 30 seconds then you clean further in ultrasonic bath but um, we have been using lately um, a liquid that we bought in the States that is named Evaporust and this is uh, a sodic salt of sulfonate, petroleum sulfonate that really cleans the surface leaving the substrate unetched. So if you are in a problem this is the best way. I'm not I, I am not paid by this company, but this is what I have been using lately and solving many of my problems. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well,